before Thorazine was invented in 1950, mental illness was often treated surgically. In fact, in 1949, the inventor of the lobotomy was awarded the Nobel Prize. But before tens of thousands were lobotomized, colectomy was all the rage. There was this theory that bad bacteria in the gut intestinal putrefaction was the cause of mental illness, so the cure was to just surgically remove the colon. Yes, the surgery killed about one in three, but when they didn't die, surgeons bragged that, for example, when he resected the colons of school children as a preventative measure, there was a cessation of abnormal sex practices, such as masturbation, which was viewed at the time as a precursor for mental illness later in life. There were others, though, that took less drastic approaches, suggesting one could instead treat this intestinal putrefaction by changing the intestinal flora. So over a century ago, there were reports of successfully treating psychiatric illnesses like depression with a dietary regimen that included probiotics. Doctors perceived a connection between depression and feces deficient in quantity and moisture, and very offensive in odor. So they gave people probiotics, and not only did people feel better psychologically, but their feces increased in quantity, became softer, more regular consistency, and the offensive smell diminishes. Concurrent with the probiotics, however, all patients were started on a vegetarian diet, so it may not have been the probiotics at all. This field of inquiry remained dormant for about 100 years, but a new discipline has recently emerged known as enteric, meaning intestinal neuroscience. Our enteric nervous system, the collection of nerves in our gut, has been referred to as our second brain, given its size, complexity, and similarity. We've got so many nerves in our gut that uh, as many as in our spinal cord. It kind of makes sense. Right? The size and complexity of our gut brain is not surprising when considering the challenges posed by the interface with our largest body surface. We have 100 times more contact with the outside world through our gut than through our skin. And we also have to deal with our 100 trillion little friends down there. It takes a lot of processing power. Now, anyone who's gotten butterflies in their stomach knows that our mental state can affect our gut. In fact, everyday stressors can affect the integrity of our gut flora. This innovative study looked at feces scraped from used toilet paper in undergrads during exam week. This is how many bacteria they had in their feces before the exam. But look what, look what happens on exam day, and in fact lasted through the whole week. So our mental state can affect our gut, but can our gut affect our mental state. We didn't know until recently. For example, many suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome complain of gut dysfunction, so researchers tried giving people probiotics to see if their mental and emotional state could be improved, and indeed it appeared to help. What about healthy people, though? This is the study that really rocked the scientific establishment an assessment of the psychotropic properties of probiotics. One month of probiotics was found to significantly decrease symptoms of anxiety, depression, anger, and hostility. How is that possible? Well, a variety of mechanisms has been proposed for how intestinal bacteria may be communicating with our brain. Until that study was published, though, the idea that probiotic bacteria administered to the intestine could influence our brain seemed almost surreal, uh, like science fiction. Well, science yes, but fiction no. Likely, organisms already inside us carry out some degree of influence on our mental well-being. So might people suffering from certain forms of mental health problems benefit from a fecal transplant from someone with a more kind of happy-go-lucky bacteria? We don't know, but this ability of probiotics to affect brain processes is perhaps one of the most exciting recent developments in probiotic research.
Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to my talk and lasting out through 4 o'clock on the second day. So if, if you don't know who I am, I'm a clinical psychiatrist. I'm not a researcher. I uh, have a tiny fingertip in academia. I do teach the introduction to psychiatry class interviewing part at Harvard Medical School. I have a hobby, which is my blog, which is why I'm here, which is evolutionarypsychiatry.blogspot.com. My disclosure is I am paid for my evolutionary psychiatry blog at Psychology Today online, but I don't have any interest, uh, research interests. I don't have stock that I'm aware of in pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about what not to eat. And when I originally did my presentation for the um, brochure, it was supposed to be for 40 minutes. So I have 20. So I kind of cut back what we're going to talk about. But I just have a couple things to talk about. And if you have questions, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in the research. And um, if I know about it, I'll let you know kind of all the latest stuff. So if you have a particular question about an anti-nutrient or something. But we're going to start out about with trans fats, which everybody know. I'm speaking to the choir here. but. Um, Everybody knows that these are bad, but sort of describing why and, and how to kind of keep avoiding them even now. They're formed primarily from the partial hydrogenation of vegetable and seed oils in our um, standard American diet. Uh, the one on the top, more biochem, is uh, linoleic acid, which is our, the primary omega-6 fatty acid in corn oil. And that does not look floppy, but in the real life, it's very, very floppy. And the bottom one is a saturated fat, stearic acid, which in the right configuration stays fairly rigid and stiff and has some nice uh, properties in a membrane. Um, the middle one is what happens if you take a polyunsaturated fatty acid and you inject hydrogen on it. And as you can see, it goes from these cis bonds, which are up there. Cis just means like that. They make like a little house to a trans configuration, which is like this. And it looks a lot like the saturated fat. So it has nice properties for your Pillsbury biscuits and your, uh, you know, your crusts and um, taking those heart healthy vegetable oils and making them into nice stiff margarine. Um, but our, our bodies can tell the difference between stearic acid and the trans acid. And our bodies know that it's not supposed to look like that. And it it's screws up a lot of stuff. And it's also highly correlated, if it's in your membranes, with sudden cardiac death, which is not that common, but pretty dramatic when it happens. Um, they're found in baked goods, fast food, margarine, commercial icings. Uh, fortunately, in the US, it, finally, they got around to, um, the FDA came in, out and said that trans fats from industrial processes are unsafe at any level. And they started to make people label them. And at that point, the amount of trans fats in the food supply dropped precipitously. Um, in 2008, California became the first state to ban restaurant chains. Um, in some cities, such as Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York City, and Boston and Brookline, which I learned uh, yesterday in the, in the law presentation, they've also banned or severely restricted the use of trans fats in restaurants. Um, but the caveat is, is some in institutional foods, like the big vat of vegetable oil or margarine or whatever they might be sending to your school or your hospital or this, they're not required to label it. So you may still find uh, significant amounts of trans fats in your restaurant foods. Uh, some of these cities have that ban, but that's, it's not true of the entire US. However, because I think of mostly the bans in the foods at your grocery store, or at least the forced labeling, um, the US population-wide sampling of at least white adult, male adults actually, showed a 58% decrease in the plasma levels of trans fatty acids between them measuring in 2000 and 2009. And this was in many, many states they measured this. And uh, in Denmark, they banned them earlier, and they've noticed a precipitous drop in the rate of sudden cardiac death. Um, that Obviously, all these are confounded, but trans fats are probably a part of that. Um, however, I know that some of us like to cheat every once in a while. I know I do. But I, I was alarmed when I found out uh, there was kind of a big expose in February of this year about trans fats that are still available in the food. Um, and you know, I don't always, and you know, maybe you don't always read the labels. Some people always read the labels. But some of them, the Marie Callender's dessert pies, pop secret popcorn was a big um, offender here. Walmart stick margarine, Pillsbury biscuits. I used to love those when I was young. And Long John Silver's fried foods, they topped the list with seven grams of trans fat per serving, which is a lot. And um, 
You can also round 0.49 grams of trans fats down to zero grams on the label. So I'm always suspicious of those Doritos packages that say zero grams trans fats because, you know, if they're throwing a lot of vegetable oil in there and frying it, I don't know. Anyway. Um, so what gets confusing and what I did want to clear up for myself as well as everybody else are these ruminant trans fats. It's actually a different trans fats. It's vaccinic acid, and it's the top one. And it's found in grass-fed butter, breast milk, and um, uh, all of your dairy products. Uh, and it's higher, actually, in grass-fed products than it is in corn-fed products. And the industrial trans fats are this elaidic acid, which is on the bottom. You can't tell a whole lot of difference between those, but apparently our, our body has. The problem with the literature is that they often put these together, particularly in the scanty mental health literature. So, but in animal studies, it's very clear that the bottom are nasty and the top seem to have some protective anti-cancer benefits, at least. Um, and so what do they do? It's a little bit of speculation, but your brain's 60% fat by dry weight. So if you have all these weird, strange-looking, creepy fats that are in there, um, it's going to cause membrane and communication problems. And there's some evidence that a lot of the cause, you know, membrane problems regulate causes with causes of obesity, diabetes, and all of these issues because the membrane is scrambling to change its configuration to help the signaling be good. So if you have these weird fats that it's not really aligned with, it'll it'll do some things to try to get the signaling to go through. And some of these things will result in inflammation and issues and problems. Um, and I think the biggest problem, or a, a bigger problem, is that it seems to displace our very, very important um, omega-3 fatty acids from the diet, which are already rare. Displacing N6, uh, the omega-6 fatty acids, probably isn't that big of a deal because we eat so many. But um, displacing the N3, getting trans fats instead of your omega-3s, it's, it's really bad for your brain. Um, and all we have, there's not a whole lot of data with mental health, but I just wanted to go in into it. it. It's been linked to depression in observational studies. Those studies did not differentiate between the ruminant and the um, fried trans fats, but in the U.S., you know, most of our uh, trans fats are from the, the margarine and those kinds of, of foods. Fast food is also linked to depression, bipolar disorder, and ADHD, except in Germany, where fast food is actually not linked to depression, but the opposite. Um, and <laughs> low omega-3 is linked to ADHD, depression, psychosis, and dementia. So the summary, we know they're unhealthy, they're still unhealthy. Um, the bans are good for the population, and I think one way of regulating that I think is actually a good idea, force them to label it so that you know what you're eating and you can make your own decision. And if you're going to eat processed food, maybe avoid the pop secret popcorn or at least look at the labels. Maybe the February expose caused them to change their minds. But in Long John Silver's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be eating there anytime soon. Um, and don't, I wouldn't worry about trans fats from ruminants. So the next thing I'm going to go over is the carbohydrates. I hope we don't have shell shock from that at the end of the day. Um, and all I can say, uh, you know, for the literature describing how car carbohydrates affect mental health sort of as a general rule, it's basically all over the place. The studies have, all have different designs, different kind of people who started it. Sometimes carbohydrates are things like soda or glucose you know, infusions, and sometimes it's rice, sometimes they're in mixed macronutrients, and so it's really hard to kind of sort out. But the, uh, the main linkage that they found is people who are vulnerable to hypoglycemia or more likely to be violent end up in jail um, and be very irritable. And uh, caffeine and alcohol will exacerbate this blood sugar drop. So you get kind of a violent person, they fast all day, they go out to the bar, they have their Red Bull and vodka, <laughs> 90 minutes later, they are being pulled to jail for a knife fight or whatever. And, um, and there's actually quite a bit of literature linking the, the, the violence angle. I was surprised by how much there was. And I'm wondering how many lawyers are going to start to do oral glucose tolerance tests on their, um, on their uh, clients. So low blood sugar will cause a surge in stress hormones, which will maybe you can be stronger and faster, but you'll be um, anxious and aggressive. And when you really look at it, about 1 in 40 people will have a truly low blood sugar, meaning we'll go down to the 40s after a, a bolus of a pure carbohydrate meal. Proteins and fats tend to ameliorate this effect. 
And other people will notice uh, changes, anxiety issues with blood sugars in the 60s, which is much more common. And I'm actually a person who, that if I eat pure carb carbohydrates, the sort of sugary stuff, about 90 minutes later, you do not want to be around me. I'm major, majorly cranky. Um, I haven't done any violence that I'm aware of. In several studies on violent offenders, those with the lowest blood glucose values during a glucose tolerance test tended to be the most aggressive and have the worst history. And they also tend to be the biggest drinkers. Uh, in the possible mechanism, low levels of brain serotonin are associated with enhanced insulin secretion, which increases the tendency to develop low blood, blood glucose levels. And then the only other literature, is, again, it's pretty scanty. Uh, women with PCOS, they notice they tend to have bigger blood sugar swings um, and reactive hypoglycemia kind of feelings, again, 90 minutes after a high carb meal, feeling just really nasty and low and, and shaky. And more likely to engage in binge eating. Now, women with PCOS aren't necessarily insulin resistant. There are a number of, of reasons for PCOS, but a lot of the times they are. And in women of normal weight with PCOS, as we've talked about in Chris Masterjohn's presentation today, et cetera, you tend to, um, the obesity may be a compensation in helping regulate these insulin and things. And so if you're normal weight, you don't have that compensation. They tend to have more wild fluctuations in their blood sugar and have more of this effect. And uh, Interestingly, in a study of uh, diabetics, blood sugar was not correlated to mood at all, except the day after they were stressed, they had higher fasting blood sugar the, the next day, which makes sense because if you're stressed, you're shooting out cortisol, which increases your blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the weird thing about carbohydrates is that there are these very famous doctors from MIT, the Wortmans, and Harvard, I believe, who um, have this book called The Serotonin Solution, and they recommend that you eat <laughs> lots of carbohydrates, pure carbohydrates and marshmallows, that kind of thing, on an empty stomach to help give you a surge of serotonin into your brain and make you happy, and contend that low-carb diets uh, cause depression. Now, carbohydrate ingestion does in lead to an increase in insulin, as we talked about before. It drives some amino acids into the cells. It causes tryptophan to be shuttled through the blood-brain barrier. It's a relatively rare uh, amino acid, and it's the precursor for serotonin and melatonin. And adding protein to meals does kind of decrease this effect unless you do it with tryptophan supplements, um, which people do to rats and uh, athletes and things. Proteins and rice have enough protein to undo the effect in some studies. So we're really talking about marshmallows, lemonade, <laughs> really kind of an unnatural, pure, pure carbohydrate foods that you wouldn't really find as much in nature. And eating carbohydrates before bed has been shown in small studies to decrease sleep latency, which is the difference between when you are go to bed and fall asleep. So you can either toss and turn for 50 minutes or if you're in, within 15 minutes is considered a good sleep latency. And it's probably because the carbohydrates could increase tryptophan in the brain, which becomes serotonin, which becomes melatonin, which tells you to go to bed. Um, so what's it? Four studies um, lasting from one week to one year directly comparing low-carb diets to high-carb. They showed better mood and increased serenity in the high-carb dieters, but each study had some real problems. The one-week study was in cyclists, and I can't think of anything that would make cyclists more cranky than suddenly depriving them of all their carbohydrates and studying them for a week before they become, you know, used to the new diet. And then, you know, they're this. This is terrible. I feel rotten, and I can't. I'm bonking. Um, and then the one-year study, which hopefully would have given us some actual real data, unfortunately, in the low-carb arm, they had twice as many people on antidepressants. Now, they swear in this long, convoluted uh, paragraph in the paper that, um, that if they take all the people in antidepressants out of the study, it didn't change the final. But there weren't that many people, and there were 12 people in the low-carb arm on, on antidepressants. So I wish, I wish they had randomized them better so we'd have better data from this study. And uh, most of these short studies, very short studies trying to figure out these effects, they use glucose drinks, or they might use high GI rice versus low GI rice. Um, but, you know, the real world, we don't really eat that way unless you're a teenager or something like that, um, like I was when I was eating, you know, Skittles for a meal when I was 17 and being really cranky um, 90 minutes later. Um, so sugar, sugary snacks, candy, and soda may be ex an exception, especially to these vulnerable young brains. And then I do have to mention, um, actually, Victoria Prince out in the audience sent me this study. 
and it's eat fat and be happy. The study compared a 41% diet, which is kind of a regular middle of the range diet, versus the 25% fat diet showed better moods, less tension, and less hostility in the higher fat diets. But that's not a high fat, low carb diet. It's just kind of a normal diet. And let's talk a little bit more about soda. Just like trans fats, we know that's probably not good for you. And uh, in all these observational studies, and, you know, soda consumption was correlated with poor mental health, increased ad aggression, knife fights in school, and uh, beating up your girlfriend and things like that. Um, and also, a bunch of people have something called fructose malabsorption, which is very interesting. And in this, the small intestine GLUT5 transporter doesn't take fructose very, very efficiently. So what happens is if you eat a bunch of fructose, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, soda, watermelon and other high fructose things it goes down kind of isn't absorbed and it goes down and feeds all the bacteria in your colon which go Wee! and they're like so excited and they get so much to eat and they bloom you can get kind of gas <laughs> and kind of crampy and um, have some loose watery stools but it's also highly correlated with inflammation low serotonin and depression which is interesting and nobody knows about this it's, Literally 30 to 50% of folks of Western or Central European ancestry and 15% of these in other ethnic backgrounds. In the US alone, that's you know, 60 million people, 30, you know, it's, it's tons of people. And the incidence of depression in the US is about 10 to 20% at any given time. So we're kind of overlapping these things. How many people don't drink soda or don't drink fruit, uh, fruit juice at all? Maybe a lot of people in here, <laughs> but... Um, so these high fructose and high sugar foods are going to be problematic and many vegetables in the very sensitive and wheat products, wheat actually does this too, wheat has fructans, which they're cleaved off and they act the same way as they're digested and they can feed the, um, the bacteria and it seems to again cause inflammation, intestinal blooms. It doesn't necessarily cause these IBS, irritable bowel uh, syndrome kind of symptoms. Um, but eating starch, interestingly enough, can increase the uptake of fructose. So if you have a banana, which has much more starch than glucose, a ripe banana anyway, then even in people with fructose malabsorption, they can seem to tolerate that and absorb a higher amount with, through their GLUT5 transporters. And it's especially prevalent, the correlation with women. Maybe this is why women are much more vulnerable to depression than men. Um, whether or not uh, carbohydrates affect your mood then, whether you love your marshmallows or you hate them and you feel cranky will depend largely upon the context, your gender, your biochemistry, your micronutrient status, um, whether or not you have really good GLUT5 transporters or not, maybe whether or not you're a, you have a high number of co copies of uh, salivary amylase. There's a lot we need to know about this. And in general, I would tell you to avoid marshmallows, particularly on a fasted, fasted marshmallows. <laughs> um, I would avoid micronutrient poor foods, soda juices, candy, and processed carb heavy snacks. Um, in many studies, however, you know, in general, if we have to take what we have, which isn't much, people are happier, sleep better, and more serene with some carbohydrates on board. But the rigorous studies that I would really be interesting uh, comparing these fat adapted low carbers with uh, the dieters, you know, the dieters eating natural, safe starches, sigh. Um, have not been done. And I'm pretty sure that's the end. Right. We have time for some questions, apparently. I've worn everybody out, it looks like. Any, uh, any science behind uh, higher protein, higher fat kind of diet and uh, serotonin or dopamine levels in the brain? The only, there were some studies there in young college men uh, that did correlate tryptophan levels with the, um, they actually fed them lean cuisine with different rices, some of them low GI, some of them high GI. That's the only thing I'm aware of. And in rats, they can make them serotonin toxic to where they scratch themselves to the point where they um, have a deadly ulcerative disease with a high carb diet and, and tryptophan supplements. So I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> yes. Emily, so uh, let's say I get a typical 40 year old woman that comes into my office. 
um, with mood issues, depression, where do you start? What, what are kind of the basic steps that you could do? Well, you know, if we're talking, uh, I kind of try to make sure that they're not vitamin deficient. I mean, really kind of take a full bore approach, really get a, a detailed psychiatric history. Obviously, if we're kind of talking about fructose malabsorption, if she has IBS symptoms, et cetera, you can do a test. It's actually fairly easy. A fasted test, you drink some fructose, and then you measure um, hydrogen, that expelled hydrogen in your breath. I'm not aware of anybody who does this except some GI docs. But in general, they will defer the testing and just say, stop eating like a jerk. Take out the soda. Don't have juice all the time. Um, and see if that improves your IBS symptoms. And they've done low fructose diets on people with fructose malabsorption, with depression. They found that clinically that their symptoms improved. So we do know from a randomized controlled trial that this can be an effective treatment for depression. However, it was just a very small trial in Germany. I'm not aware of anybody who knows about this. It could be millions and millions of people in the US. And so I'm excited about going out to um, I s I'm going to speak at Grand Rounds and, and other places around Boston where people will be doing research, and so they might be interested in this, though it's not going to be funded by Coca-Cola. Does that <laughs> answer? I would tell them, the first thing I do is say, oh, especially if you have, I talk, you know, high sugar diets and soda can cause the bacteria, I talk about the bacteria in blooming, it's kind of visual, and they're like, oh, yeah, there feels like they're, you know, maybe it's not entirely accurate, but People like that, and I say, try taking it out for two weeks. No soda for two weeks, no fruit juice, no watermelon, and see if that helps. So some people will need the more fructan avoidance entirely diet, which is actually pretty, you have to avoid onions, garlic, um, Jerusalem artichokes, I don't know how many people eat those, but um, plus wheat products, you know, things like bread that have high fructose corn syrup in them, things like that. So it can be pretty strict, but um, people have a lot of improvement if they have um, IBS and they're sensitive to the fructans and VODMAPs. 